For your entertainment, I will risk humiliation by answering board exam style questions about multiple sclerosis live. Let's have some fun. Geographically speaking, the lowest risk of developing multiple sclerosis is noted in persons living. So the answer here is near the equator. It's well known that sunlight exposure and high vitamin D levels protected multiple sclerosis. For instance, people living in Ecuador have only a 1 in 25,000 risk of the disease. In the United States, at about 1 in 350. So the answer is A here. Uh, MS lesions occur only in the brain, cluster near the ventricles, cluster in the peripheral nerves, occur primarily in the gray matter. So they occur in the spinal cord and optic nerves, so not only in the brain. They do, in fact, cluster near the ventricles or fluid-filled spaces around the brain. A cluster in the peripheral nerves is wrong. MS is a central nervous system disease and occur primarily in the gray matter, although research shows that there are lesions in the gray matter. They're primarily in the white matter. So the demyelination that underlies MS impairs nerve transmission. That's likely correct bolsters the immune attack on oligodendrocytes. It's actually the immune attack on the, the oligodendrocytes and the myelin they create that causes demyelination, so that's not right, causes perpetuation of the pro-inflammatory condition. That could be true, uh, and D permits leukocytes to enter the central nervous system. That has nothing to do with demyelination. Demyelination is a secondary effect of that. So I think the best answer here would be A. Okay, spasticity associated with MS is never painful. That's wrong. It's often painful. Does not usually affect ambulation. It definitely can affect ambulation or walking. Usually affects the muscles of the trunk and face. It would very rarely affect the face. It certainly can affect the trunk. And D is more prominent in the lower extremities than the upper extremities. That's almost always true. So that's probably the best answer there. MS pain is mainly visceral. In other words, similar to organ pain, like the pain of kidney disease, kidney stones, things like a somatic neuropathic, you know, the obvious answer here is neuropathic pain, burning, tingling, sharpness, sensitivity. That's the typical pain seen in MS. Okay, the most common ophthalmologic symptom of MS, in other words, eye symptom of MS, is astigmatism. That's a, a problem with the lens, asymmetric refraction of the lens, optic neuritis, that sounds right. Upbeat nystagmus, that can occur, but it wouldn't be the most common. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia, internuclear, it's actually internuclear ophthalmoplegia that's common in MS. So the answer is B, optic neuritis, which is inflammation of the optic nerve, commonly causes pain and vision loss. Okay, the most common type of MS is benign, malignant, relapsing, remitting, primary progressive. So the answer is relapsing, remitting MS. Benign MS refers to individuals who have the disease a long time and have relatively low amounts of disability, uh, but that's the minority of individuals untreated. Malignant refers to a very aggressive, fulminant uh, multiple sclerosis, which is luckily quite rare. Uh, relapsing remitting refers to the, time, the type that occurs in most people when they're first diagnosed where they have distinct attacks and periods of quiescence. And primary progressive MS, which occurs in about 15% of people with the disease, is described as sort of a slow, insidious worsening of symptoms over time. Okay, primary progressive MS is characterized by A, alternating series of clearly defined relapses followed by remissions. That's not correct. Steady disease progression with occasional remissions and temporary minor improvements. That sounds accurate. A C, a long-term absence of symptoms with no functional impairments 15 years after disease onset. That would be more consistent with benign MS. And D, progressive neurological impairment between relapses without any well-defined periods of remission. So uh, it's a little bit unclear what they're going for. Um, certainly people with progressive MS can have relapses. And I, I kind of disagree with D because it's very common for people with progressive MS to have periods of stability and even improvements. So probably the actual correct answer, in my opinion, would be B, but I'm going to guess they're going for D, so I'll, I'll pick D here. Okay, malignant MS occurs most commonly in older adults. 
um, I'm not sure that that's true, is also known as Utoff's phenomenon. That's not correct. Utoff's phenomenon is temporary worsening of MS symptoms related to heat or exercise, and it's actually thought to be due to recrudescence of old symptoms from areas of the nervous system that are previously damaged. Okay, it is associated with smaller lesions involving the cervical spine. That's not true. Small lesions in the cervical spine are typical of MS in general. Malignant MS is more associated with massive brain lesions and a very high burden of lesions. And then the last one, which is going to be correct, is results in major disability and usually death within one year of onset. That's definitely what they're going for. I should say that this is quite rare. Okay, early onset MS accounts for the majority of MS cases. Well, the average age of onset of MS is 30. I'm not sure if that's what they're going for. B is usually characterized by a relapsing remitting course. That's definitely true. C is only diagnosed in patients younger than 10 years of age. I'm not sure that that uh, MS prior to puberty is quite rare. I'm not sure what that, that's what they're going for. Most commonly presents with motor rather than sensory symptoms. You know, I believe the best answer here is going to be is usually characterized by a relapsing remitting course because that's definitely true. It would be extremely unusual for a teenager with MS to have primary progressive MS. That can happen. It's just quite rare. Okay. In a patient with MS, uh, a positive Helmagi kurtois head impulse test is indicative of, um, you know, I'm not really familiar with that particular test. I don't think that I use the eponym. I just call it the head impulse test. And this is a sign of a, a peripheral vestibular disease. And so I'm not sure why it would really be used for MS. I would use this test in order to assess for something like labyrinthitis, also known as vestibular neuronitis. But just by elimination, it would have nothing to do with optic neuritis, proprioception, or lesions of the cervical spine and the peripheral vestibular disease makes sense, which usually has nothing to do with MS, but I'll assume that's the answer they're going for. Okay, uh, an eloquent lesion on the brainstem is associated with which expected clinical neurological manifestation of MS? Ataxia, that could definitely occur. Optic neuritis it does not correlate with the brainstem at all. Cranial nerve palsies, that could definitely occur or trigeminal neuralgia, that could definitely occur with a lateral pontine lesion. So I'm not sure what they're talking about here because I think A, C, and D could all occur with brainstem lesions. I'll just have to assume that the most broad answer, which is cranial nerve palsies, is the most broad and correct answer. So I'll say C. Okay, an MS lesion on the cerebellum may result in tremor. That's definitely true. Visual acuity loss, no. Reduced postural control, possibly, although it's probably less likely than tremor, or bowel, bladder, or sexual dysfunction. That would be more associated with spinal cord lesions. So I'll assume they're going for A here. All right, an MRI showing small lesions that do not enhance with a contrast agent is indicative of benign MS. You can't necessarily say that. Relapsing remitting MS primary progressive MS or secondary progressive MS. Um, I mean, obviously, you wouldn't really be able to say much about the clinical phenotype, but I'll assume that small lesions would be most associated with either benign MS or relapsing or remitting MS, and I'll assume they're trying to imply that it's sort of a long-term stable patient, so maybe they're saying benign MS. I have no idea what they're getting at here. I'll guess A. Okay, most MS lesions within the spinal cord are located within the central cord. That's not true. They're usually more posterior or lateral, uh, mostly posterior. Central cord lesions are more associated with other diseases such as neuromyelitis optica. So B, dorsal columns, that's the posterior spinal cord causing mostly sensory symptoms. That is probably the answer they're going for. And then the lateral cortical spinal uh, tract, the lateral spinal thalamic tract, the best answer here is B, dorsal column lesions. Okay. The most sensitive predictor of conversion from clinically isolated syndrome to MS is it's going to be lesion load on MRI. That's going to be right. I'll just look at the other answer real quick. Uh, Mile and water fraction imaging, no. Spinal fluid, oligoclonal bands, no. Glutamate levels, no. So the answer is A here. And it turns out, based on, for instance, the optic neuritis treatment trial published in 1996, 
if you have optic neuritis and no brain lesions consistent with MS, only about 15% of those individuals actually developed MS. Okay, findings of which type of evoke potential testing are part of the diagnostic criteria for MS? Uh, well, all of them could be part of the diagnostic criteria for MS supporting evidence of demyelination. You know, we don't really do SSCPs or somatosensory evoked potentials or brainstem auditory evoked potentials anymore. We do sometimes do visual evoked potentials, but I believe the answer, if you're really old school, is A. Okay, which of the following signs and symptoms should raise suspicion that a condition other than MS is the underlying cause? So progressive from the onset, that can certainly occur in MS. Lack of peripheral symptoms, uh, I'm not sure if that answer makes any sense because peripheral nervous system symptoms wouldn't be caused by MS. An abnormal neurological examination is obviously uh, consistent with MS. And MRI abnormalities in multiple locations, that's obviously consistent with MS. So which would be, make you think that something other than MS? Probably if someone had uh, progression from onset and they had a, they were not an older person and didn't have like a clear history consistent with primary progressive MS, I would at least consider other diagnoses. I see occasional younger patients with a progressive, uh, you know, uh, progression of symptoms that end up having something other than MS. So A is probably the best answer. Okay, treatment of acute exacerbations seen with the relapsing types of MS relies primarily on the answer is corticosteroids. Adrenocorticotropic hormone can be used, but it wouldn't be commonly or routinely used. So I think the best answer here would be B. Okay. The first line treatment of an MS exacerbation is 80 to 120 units of ACTH. That's definitely not true. Uh, intravenous methylprednisolone or solumedrol, that is definitely true. Beta interferon is wrong. Oral prednisone is actually, could be correct. There's a relatively recent European trial showing that 1,250 milligrams of oral prednisone daily is effective, uh, but probably they're going for IV methylprednisolone. I actually personally use a lot of high-dose oral prednisone, so I could answer B, but probably they're going for B here. Plasmapheresis is indicated for patients with MS. Plasmapheresis is a procedure where the blood is essentially filtered to remove abnormal antibodies and other inflammatory components. I have a, a separate lecture on this. I can post a little card here. And it's used to treat a relapse that does not respond to IV steroids. So the answer here is going to be D. Beta interferon 1B is administered at a dose of, uh, so there are different formulations of interferon. So 0.5 milligrams daily refers to gelenia. 20 milligrams subcutaneous refers to glutarimer acetate. 30 milligrams intramuscular injection weekly refers to Avinex, which is intramuscular uh, beta interferon 1A, not 1B. So the answer here is going to be D, 250 micrograms subcutaneous every other day, Extavia or beta seron, for instance. Okay. Uh, which of the following is a possible side effect of glutarimer acetate? So nausea would not be very common. Flu-like symptoms would not be very common. Those are more seen in interferons. Injection site reactions are very common. And I'll post up my video where I talk about my own side effects with glutarimer. And I do mention that. Gastrointestinal events would not be very common. So the answer here is C. Mitoxantrone is considered one of the most effective drugs in resolving MS relapses but its use is limited by the risk of, and the answer is gonna be A, leukemia and cardiotoxicity. So you have to do echocardiograms or ultrasounds of the heart to monitor for this, and it has approximately a one in 100 risk of promyelocytic leukemia, which can be fatal. This medication is no longer used to treat multiple sclerosis, generally speaking. Natalizumab, which is Tysabri, acts by, and the answer is D, preventing migration of autoreactive lymphocytes into the brain. And I'll put up a card of my video on Tysabri side effects. Okay, which of the following drugs is approved for the treatment of highly active or rapidly worsening relapsing limiting MS? Uh, so, you know, most of these drugs have um, FDA approvals for relapsing forms of MS, but mitoxantrone or norvantrone, although it's no longer used, actually had a special indication for rapidly worsening MS. 
the drug of choice for the treatment of MS-related spasticity is, the answer is baclofen. It's used most commonly just because it's the least sedating muscle relaxant. Tizanidine or Xanaflex can also be used. Dantrolene is very sedating, but I have used it at times. Gabapentin is more commonly used for neuropathic pain. It's not thought to be effective in MS spasticity. All of the following behavioral interventions are recommended for patients with MS and nocturia, which is urinating a lot at night, except avoiding alcoholic beverages, that would make sense, avoiding spicy and acidic foods. I'm not sure that would really prevent nocturia. It would be good for like acid reflux. Uh, increasing caffeine consumption, that would probably worsen nocturia because caffeine is a diuretic. Decreasing fluid intake two to three hours prior to bedtime, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm not so sure about B, but C is definitely wrong. I don't think that would help at all, so I would go with that answer. Among ambulatory men with MS, the most common type of sexual dysfunction is reduced libido, erectile dysfunction, orgasmic dysfunction, premature ejaculation. Well, I don't really know the answer here, but in terms of what people complain about, the answer is definitely B, erectile dysfunction. All of these could potentially occur. I haven't really heard of premature ejaculation as really being related to MS, but I think the answer is B, erectile dysfunction. Okay, and the last one, women with MS, uh, continue their treatment with uh, women with MS who are intending to conceive should continue their treatment without pause, stop treatment for no more than one month prior to conception, be warned that pregnancy can dramatically worsen MS symptoms, or stop treatment for at least three months prior to conception if safe. Uh, this is a ridiculous question. It you know, depends on you know, if, what medications that they're taking. Generally speaking, with like glutarum or acetate, they would just continue their treatment, for example. For certain medications, we would want them to not take it for a period prior to pregnancy. I assume this is there's like older questions referring mostly to like interferons. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting it onto my screenshot. And so I, I don't really know what they're getting at, but I think probably they're going for the answer A, you know, re referring to relatively safe medications. Although interferons, can increase the risk of spontaneous abortions, possibly. So we often do recommend stopping those as well. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, please post in the comments below. And I'm gonna go ahead and put up an end screen and click my face if you wanna to subscribe to the channel and learn a little bit more about MS. And I'll also put up a suggested video that YouTube algorithms thinks, thinks you'll enjoy.